We're very excited to have our honored alumnus and college lecture speaker with us here today, Craig Pollan. Uh, and he will be speaking at the intersection of engineering and entrepreneurship, Views from the Edge. Now, I know Craig is an avid outdoorsman, and so I'm, I'm wondering if the edge means the edge of technology or the edge of a cliff somewhere. So I'm excited to see what, what, what comes. I've known Craig and Susan for a number of years um, and have had the pleasure of getting to know them and a little bit about their family and, and the wonderful things that they've done. And I promise you it's going to be a treat. Let me introduce him just a little bit to you. Following his graduation from BYU in mechanical engineering back in 1983 with his bachelor's, Craig Pollan received an MBA from Yale University, which is a great path for many of you students to also consider. And then he began working for Pacific Centered Metals, Pacific Centered Metals, excuse me. In 1998, he, per, um, he excuse me, Yes, in 1998, he purchased the company and then became president of the company. And the company has grown to become a leader in design and engineering solutions for the automotive, medical, power tool, and sporting goods industries, primarily using the powdered uh, metal and metal injection molding processes. Craig has acted as a board member and elected president of the Powdered Metal Parts Association, an international trade group. He has also volunteered time as a member and president of the board of the directors of the Yale School of Management Alumni Association and as a member of the Yale School of Management West Coast Advisory Board. Returning to BYU, Pollen has been an active member of the BYU ACET, which is a council that, that has helped the College of Engineering in its development and now as a member of the BYU Engineering Executive Council. When not working, he loves surfing, skiing, and backpacking. He and his wife, Susan Wynn, have four children. Following Mr. Pollan's remarks, we will have a benediction by Camden Peterson, one of our students in civil engineering. And now, if you would please join me in welcoming Craig Pollan. Thank you, Dean Jensen, for that uh, nice introduction. I appreciate it. I appreciate this award, uh, thanking the faculty and uh, those advisors involved with that. And uh, I'm honored to be here with you today, uh, returning back to the school uh, where I graduated in 1983 uh, in engineering. Um, I'm here to talk about a couple things that are near and dear to my heart, which is engineering and uh, entrepreneurship. But I also have to give a shout out to the LA Dodgers, who uh, won a, cl a very close game last night in the playoffs. And uh, I'm, uh, it was a good omen to me that this would be a good day. So I uh, wanted to talk, tell a, a short story about a young man named Greg Knoll. Um, sorry. Boom. OK, Greg Knoll uh, grew up in our hometown of Manhattan Beach, uh, was born in 1937, avid surfer. And uh, this is Greg uh, at the front of his posse. And they loved surfing the West Coast, but they heard of waves uh, in Hawaii that were bigger, better, warmer water. And they decided as a group they would head out to the North Shore of Oahu. And this is when surfing was really in its nascent phases. And they would, when the waves got huge, they would go look at waves in Waimea Bay. And this is an aerial uh, view of, of uh, Waimea Bay. And you can see. Uh, Kamehameha Highway along the uh, edge of the photo there in black. It runs all along the North Shore and when the waves are going off it's it's exciting just to drive along there. Well they would drive over and they would watch the waves. Too frightened to go out. No one had ever surfed Waimea Bay. It was like the Mount Everest of surfing. And uh, they went for a mul multiple years, they would drive by it every time there was a swell, and they would look at it. This is a view from the point, and they would say, man, someday we will surf that, but not yet, because they were too scared. And finally, after three years of watching it, a big swell rolled in in December of 1957, and Greg said, hey guys, we're going to stand here the rest of our lives. Let's paddle out and let's just look at it from the channel, from the deep water. Let's not surf, 
we'll just we'll go look at it. We'll think about it and see what it looks like from the channel. So they paddled out. He cajoled his friends into paddling out with him, and they got out there, and suddenly it looked more doable from the channel. It looked like maybe they could surf it. And they saw a big set coming in. They paddled over to the right into the lineup. Two of the friends, uh, the guy with the orange board and the one next to him, uh, dove for the bottom. They chickened out. One of his friends, who you see die in the motion of diving, uh, he purled. The nose of his board went under, and he, in essence, ate it. Uh, Greg Knoll, to the uh, other edge of the screen, in, uh, circled there, he took off and he made the wave and kind of rode his way into, into surfing history. He later went on, maybe you've seen this photograph, it's one of the most iconic photos in surfing dumb. And uh, this is him standing in front of what they call bonsai pipeline in the day, we now just say pipeline. And he's holding his board and uh, contemplating going out. He also uh, kind of mastered surfing at pipeline. Greg Knoll became a surf legend and uh, passed away this year, may he rest in peace. So you may wonder, what does this have to do with engineering or entrepreneurship? I'm gonna get back to that, just kind of put that in the, in the back of your mind. I wanna talk a little bit about what is entrepreneurship. Uh, it has a lot of definitions. I mean, if you put it in uh, your Google search, you'll come up with hundreds and hundreds, and everybody has an angle on it. And so we'll talk a little bit about that today. I kind of like the simplicity of the Webster's uh, definition that says, uh, an entrepreneur is a person who organizes and operates a business or businesses taking on greater than normal financial risk in order to do so. I like to add and receives greater than normal financial gain by doing so, but uh, we'll talk about that a little later in the presentation. I want to tell you about one of the greatest entrepreneurs in the world, who I knew well, and that's my father, Donald M. Paulin. This is a picture of him in 1943, 18 years old, World War II going on, and he joined the Navy. And I want to tell you a little bit about his story. He returned uh, from the Navy, graduated from USC, uh, and he got a BS, MS in mechanical engineering, yay. A little shout out here to the best department here in the College of Engineering, mechanical engineers. Oh, yay. Okay, there we go. All right, I, ha I had to do that. Get a little rivalry going. Um, he worked for uh, Ream Manufacturing, Department of Water and Power, uh, which makes electricity in Los Angeles, and worked for Quickset Lock Company, all as a design engineer in a design engineering function, and pretty much hated it. Uh, he wasn't satisfied working for somebody else. He wasn't really that thrilled with the products he was making and uh, didn't totally enjoy working as an engineer. Um, so he decided he would start his own business. He figured that was a path that he could find where he would have success and, and, and really enjoy what he, what he wanted to do. I asked him later in life why he decided to start a business, and he gave some short but poignant answers. Really hard to get ahead in a big business, one idea. Too much bureaucracy, too, many, too much in the way of politics. I don't like all that. I butted heads with my managers. Uh, and he saw an emerging technology uh, while he was working on his uh, master's degree he was studying the powdered metallurgy process, and which is a process where you take finely divided metal powders, you consolidate them into valuable shapes for industry, you send them through uh, a sintering furnace uh, using solid state uh, metallurgy, the particles fuse together in a reducing atmosphere, and voila, you have powdered metal parts which are, have high shape complexity, very close uh, tolerance, repeatability, and are extremely economical to produce. So he uh, thought about it a lot. 
and he created a viable business plan, which is an important step to deciding to become an entrepreneur. Do you have a plan? Do you have a product? He walked into the Bank of America. This will never happen, so don't use this as your plan to start your own business because it doesn't happen anymore. But he received a $5,000 loan from the Bank of America. In today's dollars, about $50,000. So it was a, I guess he had a pretty good business plan that was uh, uh, viable enough that the bank thought, okay, let's, let's trust this guy. Bought his first press. Uh, that's my mom uh, running the press, I guess his first operator, and uh, bought his first furnace. That's in our garage and uh, started a business, 1956, a business is born, Pacific Centered Metals. And uh, this, can you see the smile on this man's face? He is excited to be there. A guy that didn't enjoy his first 10 years of engineering, he is thrilled to be there. And it never really changed. This is a, a picture of, of my father uh, 20 years in, into uh, his efforts with the business, it was, the business was a success. He's holding a product that he engineered uh, out of centered metals uh, for buck knives, uh, making the handle bolster assembly in one piece. And uh, we still make that product uh, today. He was a master entrepreneur, he was successful, and more important than anything else, he was happy at what he was doing. He loved poetry. And there was a poem that he used to recite to me from Robert Frost, his favorite poet. And it goes like this, two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. And so as you're sitting here listening, think about that, that poem, uh, think about what motivated my, my father to take action and uh, start his own business and he found a happy path uh, doing that. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, I was here studying engineering. Uh, wasn't the Ira Fulton College at that point, but I was studying mechanical engineering and I really loved it. Professors were fantastic. I had a great experience here, but I was getting close to graduation and I, I really didn't know what to do. Many of you will be in the same boat very soon. I really wanted to be an entrepreneur, but uh, when I went to uh, look for that uh, position, it just wasn't available. So I made a list of what I figured were this, at least the seven entrepreneurial skills that I needed to have to be a success. Number one, I needed technical capability. And I was at the School of Engineering and I was going to get it. Uh, secondly, I had to be a leader. Some people had to listen to me and follow what I was uh, telling them to do. Uh, I had to be industrious. Uh, no, nobody starts a business uh, being casual or laid back. You have to be on your game every minute. Uh, I had to show confidence in the things uh, that I was doing. People had to see I believed. And I think this is an important trait for, for an entrepreneur. Failure management. If you're gonna get knocked off, off your ledge, you have to be able to get back on your ledge and be able to manage that because you're gonna fail a lot. You have to have ingenuity. If you don't have a product, there's no reason being an entrepreneur, right? And finally, you have to have financial acumen because you're attracting people to invest with you and to stand by you and you are uh, working with your team and telling them the right direction to go. And if you don't understand the financials, you really are going to struggle. So like I said, I was at the finish line here at BYU and I didn't really want the kind of jobs where I was getting offers. I got multiple offers to work as an engineer and I was very reticent to take them. So one company came forward and said, hey, we have an offer for you, we like you. We would like you to be a frontline supervisor at Kennecott Mines. And uh, you probably know what Kennecott is. They have the big open pit mine in Salt Lake City. My wife was going to medical school at University of Utah, so I was a little tied down location-wise. And 
the job looked super interesting to me because it met one of my criteria to become an entrepreneur. It would teach me leadership. And wham, full body slam. I took the job and it was intense. I mean, intense in a way I really wasn't prepared for. Uh, here's a picture of a supervisor standing in front of a dumper that takes uh, four car loads of ore at a time and turn, inverts them and drops it into a, a eccentric crusher and then uh, goes on and further consolidates it. And I was handed a team of 55 direct reports. Wow, I was not, you know, I mean, I thought, oh, I'll have two or three people and I'll kind of talk to them about what to do. These guys were serious, hardcore, and guys is the term. There wasn't one woman working there. They were all twice my age. I was 24. There wasn't anybody that was in their 40s. So they had worked there for most of their lives, and most of them, their fathers had worked there. So in comes this kid from BYU, and they're looking at me like, really? What in the world are you going to teach us? So it was the challenge was big, and I was given full responsibility to keep all the equipment in the concentrator uh, part of the operation running. I mean, this is serious stuff. This, this room alone is the size of a football field, and these uh, rod mills are probably 15 feet in diameter and about 30 feet long, to give you a size perspective. I knew nothing about anything I was doing, so this was a huge challenge. And my boss, most days, would say, Paulin, Keep these going. We've got to crush 110,000 tons of ore per day. Can you get your mind around 110,000 tons of anything per day? And that pace kept up day by day, and I was responsible to keep this equipment running, and it was a serious challenge. But the cool thing was I learned leadership, and I learned it the hard way. I, I grew my technical capability. I my leadership skills went from 2% to 90%, and my confidence grew immensely. I could handle any situation I was put in. I wasn't afraid anymore. I had the technical capability to do the job, but nobody believed I could do it. Now I had the confidence and leadership to do it. And finally, I was all over this one. I, failure management, I failed like every day. And I was humble with, with the men I worked with, and they picked me up, and ultimately, it was a great experience. But I was chomping at the bit. I needed to move forward. I, I needed uh, my financial capability to grow, so I applied to uh, Yale School of Management uh, for an MBA and was accepted. And honestly, I did not fit in at first. It was, uh, it was a, I'm an engineer. I'm a miner who's been wearing hard hats and steel toe boots. And, you know, this was a pretty polished crowd at, at Yale. And I, I kind of stood out and kind of tripped my way through the first semester there. But little by little, I, I, I got it down. I liked it. I had professors that were world class in terms of teaching the underpinnings of what leadership is. And I learned a lot there. My confidence grew. I could deal with polished people. I could handle myself and not do something ridiculous. And, I mean, that's their specialty, is uh, financial uh, focus as a school. So I, I learned uh, financial, my financial acumen I learned in spades. When I was getting done with Yale, again, the offers came in to work on Wall Street, to work in consulting, to work in an ad agency, oddly. Um, but, yeah, an engineer working in an ad agency, go figure that. But I, I was really still drawn to being an entrepreneur, and uh, the greatest entrepreneur I knew was at Pacific Centered Metals, and he was getting older, and I, I wanted to be there. I wanted to learn from my father and learn more so I could be a successful entrepreneur. So I joined Pacific Centered Metals, and I was... We negotiated, and I said, I really would like an equity position, and uh, he targeted 25% that if I stayed a certain amount of time that I could, I could earn a piece of the business. Um, 
I came in the business doing something, again, I knew nothing about technical sales, and uh, this was daunting. It's, it's like you fail 90% of the time. I mean, and, and if you do, you're a success. Because if you're successful 10% of the time on the work you're trying to go after, you're, you're world class. So it was a, an interesting uh, uh, switch for me moving in that direction. I focused on acquiring. I wanted the business to grow. If I was going to have an equity position in it, I felt like it needed to be bigger. We acquired three competitors. I used the skills I learned at Yale to help make those acquisitions and get them financed. And uh, that added to the business. We grew five times bigger over the next 13 years, and our profits grew over 10 times. So it, it was successful. It was great. Uh, it, 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 really, it really worked. I was excited about it. And uh, again, my skills were strengthened. Like I said, 90% of the time I failed, I was good at failure management. It was much easier than Kennecott when I went out and did sales. Um, my industriousness, I realized, grew when I had an equity stake in the business. I cared a lot more than when I didn't. And finally, taking to pr into practice what I had learned at Yale, my financial acumen uh, really grew again. So going back to my original uh, story about Greg Knoll, I kind of felt like, okay, I've been years at, at at Kennecott. I've been two years at Yale. I've been 13 years owning a small portion of, of this business. I would like to, I've looked at it close enough. I've been sitting in the channel. I, I'm, I'm ready to paddle into one of the big ones. And I, I was able to work out purchasing one of the divisions that we had then, which was again Pacific Centered Metals. And I was able to have a 100% ownership of that, of that company. And I was thrilled. I, I really wanted this opportunity to grow and develop and to do it kind of like my father had, do it on my own. However, uh, this came with new pressures that I've really, I, I knew they were there, but I hadn't really concentrated uh, about what the, how these would affect me. One, every employee you have expects to be paid every week, which sounds very simple, but when you're the one that has to come up with the money every week, suddenly it's a different equation. And until you've been there, you don't know what that pressure is, but it's a, it's a huge pressure. Secondly, you gotta convert raw materials into goods, and your vendors demand to be paid. And if you don't pay them, they don't give you the raw materials and you fizzle out of business. So again, huge pressures cash. Uh, I took on debt, more debt, to purchase the, the business. This is a, a big pressure. Every bank, every time the bank comes in with their statement, it says pay us so much per month, and that money's got to be paid or you're done. So additionally, I felt, found out that there was no passing on decisions. The decision ended there with me. I could turn it back and, and force it downward, and, and ask people reporting to me to make the decision. But ultimately, uh, the buck stopped with me, and that added a lot of pressure. Um, and when you run a business, you really have to create a culture. And I realized I had to come up with guiding principles that said, this is who we are. This is the way we operate. This is the kind of people we are. This is how we treat customers. There's a lot of thought that goes into this, into creation of, of what is that feeling of, of working uh, at this company. So these were new pressures, and honestly, uh, sometimes it was too much. I'll be the first to say it. It, it looked like we were going to hit the wall many times. It looked like this is it. I don't know if we, we, we pushed the envelope too far. We're in trouble. We don't have the cash to do this. We're going to fail at making this new component, et cetera. And I tell you, it's cool to be in a position where you need our Heavenly Father's help. And my favorite scripture became Alma 34, uh, when Amulek is, is speaking. And he says, crying to him uh, when you are in your fields. Sorry, 
not 100% on my eyesight, and I'm reading from far away. I guess I could turn around, but then you couldn't hear me. Uh, uh, over all your flocks, that they may uh, increase. Uh, over the crops of your fields, uh, that, they may pro that ye may prosper in them against the power of your enemies. And time and time again, I put this to the test, and I put my trust in my Heavenly Father and said, I'm trying my hardest. I'm giving this 110%. I want this to work. What do I need to do? And time and time again, the answers came. So I came to understand this was an important part of running my business. So what have we become? We made five acquisitions, four good ones, one horrible one that I'm sorry I got involved with. But anyway, that's the way it goes. Everything looks rosy until you sign the papers and then you realize what you got. Uh, we've grown to have seven divisions of our company. We are a world leader in PM technologies. Uh, and. Uh, Last year, we produced 63 million high-precision parts for a wide variety of industries like automotive, uh, like medical devices, sporting goods, industrial hardware, pretty much all segments of the economy. And uh, all product is made in the US, and we export almost 40% of our product lines. So very proud of that. Uh, I want to tell you, uh, you know, take it from the uh, general and go more specific. Uh, 2022 Chevy Silverado is an example. We're, uh, we make the airbag components for that truck. Uh, we make the seat belt components for that truck. Uh, we make shock absorber parts, uh, exhaust management system components, engine components, and finally steering gear uh, components. So I picked a simple one just so it was easy to understand. Um, for the uh, height adjustment on the steering wheel mechanism, everybody needs to have the steering wheel go up and go down with a little motor. Um, so we uh, were re uh, a company that we've done business with, Bosch Automotive, uh, contacted us and said, hey, we're looking at this steering column. This is a CAD view of the steering column. and." we'd like you to look at the rake uh, adjustment met housing for this. This is a little bit more of a blow up. Those two gray parts that I'm pointing to are the rake, rake adjustment housing. And they said, we're gonna make 1.2 million of these per year for the next seven years. Would you guys like to make it? So we, this is 2019. This is what the product cycle takes. We developed uh, these two parts with the uh, design engineers, quality engineers, uh, a whole team of Bosch engineers, I would say more than 30 engineers, uh, worked on this assembly. And we made a part that has very high strength. It's a low alloy steel, has very high hardness, and uh, uh, this is, uh, shows some of the dimensional requirements for the part, has close tolerances. Uh, we were able to develop this, and let me talk a little bit about the uh, s development process we go through. I've talked a little bit about the design. We then bid it to a different group within Bosch and say, here's, here's how we'll do it. This is the way we will approach this product. Whoop, sorry. Uh, we will uh, then prototype it. If we win the bid, in this case, we won the bid. Uh, we'll prototype to make sure the assembly works. Uh, we'll go into hard tooling it. Again, different groups of engineers uh, with each, each of these efforts. We hard tool it internally uh, so that we can go into a pre-production mode. For about a year, we'll make short runs of parts to prepare for mass production, make sure everything works smoothly on the line, and then we finally hit serial production. We currently produce about 25,000 of these beautiful parts uh, per week, and I'm thrilled. I, th I think it's exciting to take and create something from nothing. Uh, there's a, I have put this saying on my, on my wall, and uh, it's from Henry Ward Beecher. The ability to convert vision to things is the secret of success. And for me, it is the secret of success. I, I love this creation process. I stay close to it. I'm very involved with our, our customers, and 
and the developments that we're working on, and I, I think it's exciting. Okay, we gotta switch gears and talk a little bit about David and Goliath. It's a story you've heard a million times. I want you to look at this statue of David as he stands in the Valley of Elah in the morning that he's gonna step out onto the battlefield to face Goliath, somebody that was at least twice his size, and he was gonna go mano a mano with him was kind of the concept, and, and, and have a battle, and whoever won would win the spoils, the other, the other country in essence. And so the stakes were very high. And this is, you can kind of see in his face, I'm probably reading a lot into this because I don't know what he was really thinking, but he's looking across the valley and thinking about a couple things. And I, I think, what would I be thinking? Why did, why did he do it? There's uh, definitely the risk side of this portfolio, and then there's the reward side. And one thing you have to know about every single person in this room is you live with this portfolio on everything you do. It was a risk reward to come here to BYU. It's gonna be a risk reward to take a job like I did at Kennecott. You're gonna make a series of these value decisions about risks and rewards. And ultimately when my father made the decision, I'm going out on my own, I'm starting my own business. It was a risk reward. And if you view the risks high, if you have anxiety over that, then it doesn't matter how big the reward is. Oddly, in this case of David, I think he knew that the risks were actually small because he had technology that other people weren't thinking about. They thought he was going to go fight uh, Goliath mano a mano, but he picked up a rock and slung it and killed Goliath and solved his problem. So he knew the risk was small. And this is a, a trait of entrepreneurs that I think everyone in the room has to think about. The risks sometimes look big to other people, but if you're Elon Musk, the risk looks very, very small because you know where you're going and you know what you're gonna accomplish. So you have to understand this risk reward frontier in your life. And if you can't handle it, then move on. You know, there's plenty of other things you can do. So, as we've talked about uh, the skills required to become uh, a, a successful entrepreneur, we have uh, added a few more things to my initial list. When I was 24, I couldn't see all these things, but having done this over the last 30 years, I can see a lot more. So I'm adding these three things. You need to have a risk-reward ratio that makes sense to you. You need to have a robust product, one that is either so cost-effective that it takes over the marketplace or offers such a unique feature that it takes over the marketplace, or three, it generates its own marketplace. So third thing is you gotta be the kind of person that loves control. You like to be in the driver's seat. You wanna be at the vortex of what's going on. If you don't like that, then being an entrepreneur, this isn't for you. Additionally, you need the seven skills still. Don't forget those. I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably patent these and go on a lecture series and talk about them. Nah, they're just thoughts. But you have to have capital formation. Um, if you don't have money, you can't be an entrepreneur. Or you'll give up so much of your ownership in the business, in essence, you're not an entrepreneur. And finally, I added prayer and faith. It, it really is a foundation that makes everything work. Okay, this wins the award for my busiest slide, but bear with me a little bit. I live and have lived in the world of engineering for many, many years. And I have dealt with literally thousands of companies and thousands of engineers of every imaginable type. And I love it. It's an exciting place to be. Uh, these are companies that I've dealt with in the engineering in the last year, but so I just kind of threw some of them out there. But they're all making exciting products and it's really fun to be working with them. Um, all of you are probably gonna find jobs with companies like these and, and you'll pro potentially, you will enjoy it. Um, so you have to ask, you know, really where will you fit in? And I, I see engineering in kind of three quadrants. 
uh, one being kind of more the, the academia, uh, research oriented, those that work in product uh, development, creating products, and uh, finally those that are in kind of the fulfillment end, uh, the production side of the equation, actually making the product. So you may have a passion for one of those areas, but regardless of what you choose, uh, the time may come where entrepreneurship is something that you can look at and think about. I know a lot of engineers that when they get there, they immediately just say, no, I don't want to know about it. But I think you shouldn't be so hasty in that decision. Uh, even uh, Dean Jensen, as an academic, has crossed that border and has stepped into entrepreneurship and has been successful with it. So it can be done. It, it just depends if it's the right thing for you. So the view from the edge is right now, you're gonna be developing careers in engineering. That's why you're here, that's why you're studying. So you're sitting on that bedrock and you may stay on that bedrock for 50 years and you may be thrilled with it and you may be making products that are just fantastic and you're very happy with it and you have no desire to look over the edge and consider is there a future for me in entrepreneurship? So go back to the original Greg Knoll story. And you know, the question is, and it's fine if you don't choose entrepreneurship, there's no better or worse. I mean, Greg Knoll and his friends could have all been killed at YMEA paddling out and trying to surf there. So maybe this was a stupid idea, but it worked and they were successful. But the key thing is, I always tell people, hey, let's look at this a little closer. Let's get out in the channel. Let's not do this from a million miles away. Let's go meet this customer. Let's go meet this person. Let's find out what's going on, what's motivating them, what, what kind of pro how could we help them in their product cycle. And by sitting in the channel, sometimes I've been able to paddle in into a nice set and, and good things have happened. And I think the same thing is, is true for each of you. When in doubt, check it out from the channel. And I challenge you to develop your skills. I've, I've given you 10, 11, 12 things. That's a lot. Usually, you know, people try to consolidate, but, but they're all true. They're all important. Secondly, study the spot like Greg Knoll and his friends did. You got he had three years of looking at this place before he took off on his first wave. Study your opportunity. Wait for the big swell. That means wait for when the opportunity is right to be able to take off. Check it out from the channel. Get closer and closer and closer to your idea and thoughts about, is this viable? Is this work? Could I go to the Bank of America and show my business plan? Would it work? And if the if the swell is right, maybe you check it out from the channel. You paddle out, and if that feels right, then paddle in, and uh, you can get a, a, a great wave, exhilarating experience like my father did, like I have, and like I've watched uh, many other do. I know some of you are gonna do some fantastic things, and I hope that uh, my comments today will be helpful as you consider entrepreneurship and where it intersects with engineering. Thank you very much. Thank you.